the Human Resources Department of Canton Township are sticklers, believe it or not. Okay, now I'm going to pass around this beautiful little sheet that I just read off of. Please indicate your political party preference that is on the application you filled out and sign in. We will be paying you $20 today, which is less than you would make if you were at McDonald's right now working for two hours. Um, but we do want to show our appreciation for you for being here. I am handing out our updated Canton Township Election Day manual. How many individuals have gone on to the township website and gone to the online training center and reviewed some of the existing material? Lovely. If you printed up a manual there, it is not up to date. I changed the manual yesterday because as what, what happens in elections is everything changes all the time. Outside of that, I have a reputation of being a change agent and I like to change things and continuously improve the process. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Michael Segrist. If you are a Canton resident, I am your clerk. I work for you until today. After this certification training, you work for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, just go ahead and sign that, pass it on. Thank you. Um, I will show you kind of where we're at. Um, you know, the cardinal rule of presenting is you're not supposed to hand paper handouts while you're doing a presentation because people will inadvertently disengage the part of their brain that is active listening and they will begin to read the printed material you gave them. Um, I broke that rule just now, but I trust that we'll be okay. Um, and we're going to go through that manual together, not all 68 pages because that would not be a good use of our time today. This is going to be the base level certification. So when we talk about things that have changed in Canton Township since the last election, right, 95% of the people in the room worked the 2020 election. Thank you for coming back. Um, there's been a number of changes since the 2020 election. How was the 2020 election in November? How did it feel? People who worked it. Um, was it the busiest election you've ever worked in the precinct before? Or have you ever been pushed harder? Thank you. 2016 was busier. However, what if I told you that 2020 was the largest election in Canton history? Well, I think, I think the 2020 was was busy, but the, I think we were better at it and things went smoother than Ooh. 2016. Things is better at it and things went smoother. Like that. Good stuff. Okay. Yeah, you guys have kind of figured out I was going to lead you down a little rabbit hole, which is that while 2020 was the largest election in Canton history, the, the number of individuals who voted in the precinct on election day plummeted. Um, and a couple of things are the cause. Um, the first would be that in 2018, a proposal called 183 was passed to promote the vote, which gave people a constitutional right to vote an absentee ballot without a reason. Any voter, regardless of age, can vote an absentee ballot. Even the term absentee ballot indicates that an individual would be absent from the community and would be unable to vote. Now you don't have to be absent, so the term absentee ballot is almost pointless. It's a mail ballot. We mail the ballot to you. I got to vote an absentee ballot in 2020. I was unable to vote an absentee ballot in 2018 because I did not meet one of the five statutory requirements for voting an absentee ballot. I could have lied like most people, um, but I'm not a liar. I can't sign something that's not true, make up a... a, a now, being appointed an election inspector was a, what used to be a valid reason for voting an absentee ballot. Um, and just a little caveat, for those of you who haven't 
I'm going to recommend you apply for and vote an absentee ballot if you intend on voting in the August primary. Um, it's a long day. What time do polls open? 7 a.m. What time do we arrive in the precinct? 6 a.m. at the latest. What time do polls close? 8 p.m. What time do we finish up at the earliest? 9 p.m. That's a 15-hour day. For you guys. For me, it's a 36-hour day, which I don't know how physics allows that to happen, but, it, but they do. Um, so in a 15-hour day where you really only have one designated hour-long break where you can leave the precinct, um, guaranteed, the last thing you're going to want to do after witnessing individuals stand in line, process voters, vote their ballot, and then tabulate their ballot, the last thing you're going to want to do is get in your vehicle instead of eating instead of relaxing, drive to your polling location, get in line, and then go through that process that you have witnessed four to 500 times. Um, also, you could be assigned to the Absentee Voter Counting Board. If you are assigned to the Absentee Voter Counting Board, you will be unable to vote in person because we will start at 7 a.m. and we will not finish until well after the close of polls. You are legally sequestered and unable to leave the room, even for voting purposes. So you would be required to vote an absentee ballot if you wanted to exercise your right to vote. You could always not vote, although if you're here today, odds are you think that voting is important and the fact of missing an election would be horrible. I would feel horrible about that. So. I'm going to recommend you, if you have not already applied for an absentee ballot, do so. Who here has applied for an absentee ballot for the August primary? Who here has received their ballot in the mail? Who here has voted their ballot and returned it? <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, I definitely did. Um, one of the first, but not the first. We've already had, and we had our first spoiled ballot yesterday. A guy put his through the laundromat, um, he brought it in soaking. Um, and we gave him a new one. So that has happened. But anyway, so because we have absentee voting um, legal for anybody, for any reason, um, and in 2020 because, um, I don't know if you know this, we had a global pandemic, that um, a number of individuals, a substantial majority of voters, didn't think it was wise to congregate in thousands and thousands of people unnecessarily and breathe the same air. And so people chose to vote an absentee ballot. 75% of voters in the August primary of 2020 voted an absentee ballot. Prior to 2020, the highest we'd ever had was about 30%. In November, 70% of voters voted by mail. So a, a precinct in a, in a normal election, presidential election, would usually handle between 1,000 and 1,100 voters on election day. We never got above 750, 800. That was the highest. So how many of the 12,000 this year? We are currently at just over 12,000 absentee requests. Uh, to put that into perspective, the 2018, sorry, the 20, 2020 August primary, we probably issued, I want to say, 15,000 ballots. So we're, we're, we're going to see a lot of people voting absentee now. Even though um, the pandemic may not present as serious as it did at the time in 2020, um, obviously, one, reality will be forever changed. So. We won't be disinfecting this year um, because we learned early on in the pandemic that it was an air war, not a land war, right? The only, you know, the, the, the danger of transmission is, is going to be through breathing. Um, so we will have masks available at the applications to vote station just like in 2020, um, but we will not be going to the extent um, that we did in the past. Uh, but we are going to expect a number of individuals to be voting absentee going forward. Um, the automatic application list, who's on the automatic application list for an AV ballot in Canton Township? 
I am, um, which means I automatically get an application mailed to me every single election cycle, and I have the choice to vote an absentee ballot if I want to. When I took office in 2016, that list was about 8,300. It is now at 35,000. Um, so life has changed substantially. And as a result, we have consolidated precincts. We had the decennial census happen in 2020. And as a result, we used to be in the 11th congressional district. We are now in the 6th congressional district. We have to compete with Ann Arbor now for political power. We used to have Oakland County we had to go up against. Now it's Ann Arbor. Okay, we are in the 6th congressional district. A number of other things have changed. Uh, for all intents and purposes, almost everything else is the same with the exception of the fact that I took it as an opportunity to consolidate precincts. We went from 40 precincts to 33 precincts. We went from 20 polling locations to 12 polling locations, which means the entire voting process has changed. How we run the precinct on election day has changed, which is why my two brand new folks have nothing to unlearn. Walker Winter is gone. No more Walker Winter. I mean, it's still physically there. It's still a school in the Wayne Wesleyan School District. Kids are still being educated there, but it's no longer a polling location. We got out of most of the elementary schools, with the exception of Field and, and Erickson and Halston. Um, we've consolidated, we, we've moved, so instead of two precincts at Salem, there's three. Instead of two precincts at Plymouth High School, there's three. Instead of two precincts at Canton High School, there's three. And we're not in the cafeteria anymore, we're in the gym, which was bigger. And I had to fight with the athletic directors to ensure that we would get access to that facility, especially because they put in a brand new floor there with their bond money. Um, so anyway, that is uh, some of the changes, and we're going to go over that today. Um, another change, my wife and I had another baby, uh, so the last time I did training, we had a, like a nine-month-old named Jack, who is now three, and he is punishing me in ways that I punished my parents, but times ten. He's a very energetic child. I love him. He's so cool. But I have a one-year-old named Sloan who is, oh, she's just my world right now. She's so sweet, um, and I love her. But that also means that my brain doesn't function as well as it probably should. I don't get the sleep that I used to, and life is total chaos. So please forgive me. Another thing that has changed, Canton Township's website for most of my life has been canton-mi.org. Um, but because government and elections, believe it or not, have become controversial. Um, and if you do believe what you read on the internet, you should not believe what you read on the internet um, or apparently watch on TV. But in an attempt to give good, quality, accurate, trusted information, all elections divisions and local governments, county governments, and state governments are recommended to shift from .com and .org and .net addresses to cantonmi.gov. The entire township is migrating to .gov. You will see that all of the email addresses are going to be changing to .gov. If I want to get to our stuff, I'm going to type in slash vote. cantonmi.gov slash vote. And it's going to take me to... Huh, Every time I do that, what did I do wrong? Why didn't the website open up? I'm not on the Wi-Fi. So even the clerk is subject to making interesting choices like that. Okay, so I'm going to get to our elections website. If you want to see the new precincts as laid out, we have an interactive GIS map that is searchable. Notice, in the past, if you worked, you may have been at Precinct 4 and Precinct 20 in the same location. Precinct 1 and Precinct 37 
That's because there was no rhyme or reason to how the precincts were numbered. One, the precincts are now numbered sequentially. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if you work at a location, odds are you'll be precinct seven, precinct eight. That part has changed a little bit. But this is what the new precincts look like. And those are our 12 polling locations, these beautiful little blue dots. Um, and um, I can go in there and I can type in my address. 245 Princess Drive. And it's going to take me to my house. And it's going to show me this beautiful number, little, this number 15 right here. I'm in precinct 15. This is my house. I vote at Field Elementary School. And there's the address. I used to vote at Bentley. So what does that mean? That means my neighbors. Now they're going to get noticed. We have put it in the focus for the last four months. We have it on the website. We are going to be mailing everybody very shortly new voter ID cards. They'll probably come into your precinct and be like, do I need this to vote? No, they don't. That's nice they brought it. And that's going to tell them where they vote. But people ignore. And we're busy, right? We're all busy. I mean, I have those two kids and I have three dogs because I'm a glutton for punishment. Um, and so lots of things are competing for my attention. So let's say I show up at Bentley on election day. One, Bentley's closed, so there's no voters there. <laughs> there's no inspectors there. Um, but there's a sign there that says your polling location has changed. It's going to direct me to this map. I will look it up and I will go to the correct location if I'm lucky. Um, if uh, I used to vote at field and I show up at field, well, I might get in line. That's something we're going to have to figure out. So, so that's something we're going to want to keep in mind. A number of voters are going to go to their historic location for voting. We're going to have to intercept them and redirect them to the correct location. Um, but anyway, this is our interactive map. This is a tool that we are going to be using. For our purposes, when I go to poll workers, this little tab on the left, I scroll down under training. Step one. Head to our new online training center and review all materials carefully. Once I click here, I've got a couple of cool things. I've got the absent voter counting board manual, and any Canton resident can review that. Any resident, anybody with access to the internet can review our manual for how we process AV ballots. I don't trust the AV process. I want to see my ballot get scanned. I don't know what you do with them. Well, read that manual. That manual right there is going to tell you exactly what we do with your absentee ballot. Election day manual, what I just printed out for all of you, is located right there. That beautiful little Statue of Liberty. Would you send me over there? Yeah. I would click it right here. Um, I could right click it and hit download, or I open it. Now it's acting up right now. I click it. Come on now. All right, maybe I'll double click it. I hit download here, or I hit print if you want to waste 68 pages. Print both sides, it cuts it in half at least. This is a cool quick guide on the, the AV Vote Center, so if you don't want to read a big manual, this cool little guide right here. This I recommend everybody watch. You can watch it on your phone, you can watch it on your computer at home, you can watch it at work as long as your boss isn't around. Um, it's a 12-minute it's a, it's a, it's a video. Anthony Smaker is going through loading a poll book, processing voters, and then running the reports at the end of the night. That scary process that we worry about, he goes through opening, closing, and processing voters in 12 minutes. Well, that's pretty reassuring. If I were showing up and I was not comfortable with the poll book. Let's say I chose not to read, watch this video between now and Election Day. And unfortunately, nobody in my precinct watched this video between now and Election Day. If it's 7 o'clock in the morning, we've all, 6 o'clock in the morning, we've all sworn our oaths. People are going about doing the things we do in the morning. My EPB person could go online on their phone 
click on that video and watch it as they set up the poll book. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I recommend watching that video. It's 12 minutes of your life. Can I just interject something there? By all means. I don't know if they want to hit pause or whatever back there so they don't hear me. But um, Actually, I tried to do it at home on a tablet. My tablet's like you know, maybe a year and a half old. Told me my um, browser was not current, so I updated my browser, and then it still wouldn't let me do it. Just FYI. Cool. So I did go to the library this morning before I came in, and I watched it. And you watched the video. Okay, there could be some technological issues that people have to work through. Um, she talked about um, the challenges she experienced trying to watch that video. Yes, people are going to approach this process with all types of technology and different states, and that's going to be a factor as we move forward. All right, we'll talk about that in a minute when it comes to the ESR supports. This right here is the Managing Your Precinct on Election Day. It's my favorite publication from the Bureau of Elections. I have many favorite publications from the Bureau of Elections. I'll tell the new folks, I'm a bit of a nerd. You're going to find that out. Um, but this is a really good one. And this is known as the blue flip chart. I've talked about this in the past. I fawned over this document in the past. It will be included, if we can acquire them before August, in your red chairperson binder. I like it because it's basically an FAQ, a frequently asked questions of what happens on election day or what happens in the precinct. And so like, if it's going to happen, odds are it's going to be on one of those tabs. And what's cool about it is you can open it to the tab and, it tells, and you can walk right through it. So there's a challenger there. In my precinct, I, I don't know. We didn't really cover challenges in the training. I don't know what to do or how to handle. I don't know how to make a challenge ballot. Well, I could do an ESR, reach out to the clerk's office, try to get instructions. I could wait for a representative of the clerk's office to come help me do a challenge ballot, or I could get my blue flip chart out. I managed my precinct on election day and flipped to challenged voters. And then there's the step-by-step -step process on how to do a challenge ballot. I love this document. This election inspector certification PDF is the certification training we're going to do today. You can review all of the slides that I have right there. And then this is the voter assist terminal setup. This video is a 90-minute video on how to set up the VAT, which is for voters with disabilities. And any voter can use it if they want to. Um, a little caveat, I talked about things that had changed. While Anthony S. Maker is the individual who did our poll book training video, Anthony is no longer the deputy clerk in Canton Township. Anthony is now the clerk in Ferndale, Michigan. So he was elevated to the position of clerk in Ferndale. He is a colleague of mine. Uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and he is um, doing a great job over there. And we applaud him and we're happy. Um, we are sad that he left us, but we are very happy for him and his success. We have elevated Katie Baker from my office into the position of deputy clerk. And she has been doing that for about two weeks now and she's doing a great job. So you'll be interacting with her. Ms. Kendra Bird over here is one of our newest additions in my office. She is the records manager and data specialist she will also be assisting on election day. So you may see her as well. Um, we've had a couple of new folks join the clerk's office in the last couple of years. So this is the online training center. You can spend time with it. I kind of showed you how to get there. Super cool if you're into that kind of stuff. But I recommend doing it now, kind of building a critical mass. If everybody in the precinct watches that video, you're not all going to be really uncomfortable around the EP, on the, around the poll book. You still might be uncomfortable around the poll book, but at least everybody will have spent some time with it. Um, so there's that. Um, let me get up our training, and we'll jump into it. Oh, I'm not on the network. So I'm going to log into my VPN. And then I will be able to open up our PowerPoint for today's training. There it is. You've all seen my recent folders. So there you go, my recent files. Notice it's like all election 
related stuff. Um, here we go. Oops, that's not what I want to do. That's what I want to do. Okay, so it's going to take it a little while to connect. First and foremost, this is uh, about the HR process. And we already kind of got this out of the way. Um, everybody has to um, fill out a new application every two years. Brand new folks have to fill out a whole packet with a lot of information. What is the point of training? The first point of training is it is required by Michigan law. I am required to train inspectors every two years. Your, this certification process will expire in two years. Um, also, laws and, 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 and procedures change every two years. Uh, the 2020 process went virtual. We didn't have in-person training in 2020. Um, so that was interesting. What is interesting is that we did notice um, that errors reduced in 2020. So perhaps there's something to be said for the virtual training that we did. Homework reminder, if you haven't gone through the manual before today, please do so before election day. And I'm just going to like speak briefly on this. Um, prior to being elected clerk, and I was elected in 2016, um, I did tax work and accounting work. And while I'm not a CPA, I have a Master's of Science in Taxation, which I'm very proud of from Walsh College of Accountancy and Business, which is a fantastic institution, specifically their MST program. Um, which really means I'm a specialist in the U.S. tax code. And the U.S. tax code is pretty gigantic, right? And every couple of years, people run for office and say that they're going to shrink the tax code, and they're always lying. They always make it. And, and CPAs and tax professionals love it when we hear people say, I'm going to shrink the tax code, because what we know is whatever they do will end up making the tax code more complicated and requiring you to hire a professional to do your taxes and making them a lot of money. Um, so be very wary of people who say they're going to shrink the tax code. They're always lying. Um, but what's important about the tax code is it is not a good use of my intellectual capacity to memorize the tax code because A, it's impossible unless I am a savant, and B, um, why would I do that? I can just pick up the tax code and read it. Why would I memorize it? And what's interesting is, is when in, in pedagogical approaches to education right now with students, kids these days are growing up in an environment where they have access to 100% of the information that has ever existed in the course of the world at their fingertips. Now, they may choose to play games on the Internet, and adults may choose to fill their heads with misinformation on the Internet, um, because 100% of the information out there is not mean it's 100% of accurate information, unfortunately. Um, however, uh, the challenge in the education process is no longer about rote memorization, which is probably how most of us were taught. Um, we, we memorized our times tables. We did spelling bees. We memorized definitions. Um, we tried to memorize um, algebraic equations. Um, and the issue is, is that these kids have access to all of that stuff by pushing a button. And so it is not necessarily determined to be a good use of educational or intellectual capacity to memorize things. Instead, we train people how to acquire or access information that is stored somewhere else in the cloud instead of their brain. And I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. No CPA should memorize a tax code and no clerk or election inspector should memorize the manual. Don't be overwhelmed by election law. Don't be overwhelmed by the manual. Do not try to learn everything. You will be paralyzed. Instead, what they trained us at Walsh and what I train inspectors to do here is I need to learn how to use the tax code. I don't need to know that Section 63 is where income is defined and taxation is established. I just need to know how to use the index. I don't need to know that section 200 is where the deductions are. I just need to know how to use the index. I don't need to memorize every deduction. You don't need to memorize everything in this manual. 
when you move past the beautiful front page, you get to the index. And the index is very simple. It's color coded. Green is getting started. That's going to help you use this manual. Blue is opening the polls. If I'm going to focus on election morning, I'm going to open up to the blue. If it's 6 a.m. and I'm a chairperson, I'm going to get my red chair binder. And I'm going to do two things. I'm going to pull out my receiving board ticket, which is this beautiful little thing. And we're going to talk about this a lot. Because in 2020, we piloted this. And a number of these were not brought back on election night. I can tell you this, you will not be excused on election night without bringing the receiving board ticket. This is the ticket to see the receiving board. This is the ticket to go home. It's also a super awesome checklist. And if you do the bare minimum and check every one of these items, no matter what happens on election day, you will have won run a legal election and a decent election. It may not have been pretty, but this is all you need to do. This is the base document. And so the first thing I would do if I'm a chairperson and I walk in at <coughs> 6 o'clock is I would immediately go to this document, I would unfold it, and I would set it down on a table. If I were a good chairperson, the second thing I would do is get my manual out and open it up to the baby blue section. Um, but to get there, the third page is going to have how to get support from the clerk's office throughout the day. Let's say I have an older smartphone or I don't own a smartphone or I just don't feel comfortable around technology. That's fine. We welcome everybody to work the elections. I would find somebody in my precinct who is good with technology and I would say, you are going to be responsible for this. This is a QR code. Most people at this point understand what a QR code is. If you've seen these, they exist in the world. If you've never used them before, that's fine. I, I don't use them much. Uh, they were really popular at restaurants during pandemic. They got rid of the printed menus and you would do the QR code. But then if you're like my mom, you'd be like, I I'm not doing that. Can I get a paper menu? And she would get a paper menu and she never learned how to use a QR code and she's going to go on in life and that's fine because she just decided to stop moving forward with everybody else. And there's a point where, like, I do that with a lot of stuff, too. I'm just like, I'm not, I'm not buying into whatever this, this is. I'm going to kind of stick with kind of what I'm comfortable with. So if you're uncomfortable with QR codes, find somebody who isn't. They're going to get their camera up. They're going to put it over the QR code like this. They're going to click on the link that pops up. See, you don't have to be in the Starship Enterprise to figure that out. You point your camera at it, a link pops up, you push the link, and you've got access to the ESR. And the ESR stands for the Electronic Support Request Form. And we piloted this in 2020. And thank you for using it because you all won me an award. My office won an award from the U.S. Election Assistance Commission for outstanding innovation in technology and cybersecurity for using the ESR support and dispatching according to the ESR report and using the quantifiable information through the ESR report. Because in the past, you would all just call my office. Did, in the past, did anybody here ever call the office and not get the, the phone picked up? Did you ever call the office and get put on hold and then no one picked, the phone, and no one, no one picked up the phone again? And here's why. There are 300 election inspectors. There are 75,000 registered voters. And there are six phone lines in Township Hall for the clerk's office. Do the math. You don't have to be, you don't have to have a degree from Walsh College to do that math. That math is very simple. The phone 
was the least efficient way to handle issues on election day. And so we created this little electronic support request form. I identify the location of where I am, my precinct number. I select what has happened or what is going on and I type in the details. Maybe I need to look up a voter because they were issued an absentee ballot and they don't have it with them and I want to make sure that they're not going to try to vote twice. I hit the ESR report, I type in the voter's name and DOB, I send it to the clerk's office. What happens is it immediately is populated through this form onto a giant crash board in my office. It's a spreadsheet based on the severity of the situation it is color coded and will jump to the top of that. And we begin to dispatch based on the severity of the issues. That's called triage in an emergency room, right? Because while I running out of I voted stickers is very important to the one person in station number four in one precinct because voters get very upset if they don't get an I voted sticker. That, believe it or not, in the realm of incidences that we will deal with on election day would not rise to a level five severe situation. It might be a level five situation for station four. And I respect that, I honor that, I appreciate that, I love that. It is not a severe situation for us. And then we will have those rovers out in the field. We will have them either dispatched to your location within two minutes if there's an incident, or because you type in a callback number, you will re receive a phone call on that good number from my office within two minutes. We will either walk you through the solution or we will ensure somebody is there. Now, one of the benefits of having 12 locations instead of 20 locations is we have the same number of staff. Staff people will be able, rovers, staff people will be able to spend way more time in your precinct on election day. They will be there to fix tabulator jams, to help with challengers if you don't know, to help with provisional ballots if you're confused about how to do a provisional ballot. All those weird intricate things. My representatives will be in the precincts. I will be able to get to more precincts. So a rover will be in your precinct every half hour helping you balance, helping you solve poll book issues so that at the end of the night there's not a bunch of weird stuff going on that you have to kind of solve and try to figure out. And then 9 o'clock turns to 10 o'clock and 10 o'clock turns to 11 o'clock. Or you decide to leave at 9 o'clock, you come to Township Hall and then we have to call back every inspector because something wasn't done right. And then we have to wait and we, or we have to send a police officer out to find somebody, to bring them, to wake them up at midnight, to bring them to Township Hall, to re-sign a piece of paper. That's not fun either. So in this scenario, we solve the issue when it occurs in the precinct. And so you're going to get more TLC. Um, so that's super cool. And that's how it's done. In the manual, using the ESR, identify somebody who can do that for you. Okay, as we move forward, I'm just going to burn through this manual real quick with everybody. There's a list of the supplies you're going to receive if you want to inventory that. Um, getting started first steps, what do I do? I show you a picture of that receiving board ticket. That is your ticket to, to go home. Nobody gets home without that. I'm going to say it seven times today. I'm going to remind you of the receiving board ticket because invariably what will happen is Chair people will come in uh, to my office on election night at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock and they're not going to have this filled out. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be saying to you, do you remember when I was pacing back and forth and I told you I'm going to tell you seven times about this receiving board ticket and how you can't go home without this receiving board ticket filled out? I prophesied in that moment that you would be here today having not had this filled out. And I just want you to know that like Nostradamus, I am a fortune teller and I knew this was going to occur because I knew that my seven reminders of the insignificance of the receiving board ticket would go unheeded and you wouldn't be done and now we're going to have to go through it. So it has been three times I have mentioned the receiving board ticket, we've got four more to go. All right, there's some information there about the tabulator. but. Opening the polls, this is where I would start on election day. And what's cool about it is, is so it's color-coded. The top is going to tell me where I am in the manual. 
If it's the beginning of the day, I better not be in purple. Because purple's closing the polls, right? There's a summary of what the blue section is. This section covers the basics of opening the polling location and preparing for the first voter. This section covers setting up the tabulator, setting up the voter assist terminal, preparing the laptop, and organizing all supplies. Okay, that's a good summary. If I have a concern or a question about supplies, it's probably going to be in this section. If I want to know how to set up the tabulator, it's going to be in this section. If I want to know how to close the polls, yeah, it's probably not in this section, right? Cool. There are two ways to look at the world. I am not the first person. There is, on the beginning of every one of the sections, a diatribe, a long list of words. There are 16 items here that if you really like detailed instructions and you are a technical person, you can go through this 16-point plan to open up your precinct as a chairperson. You could pull this out, go through all 16, and then grab your receiving board ticket, as the fourth one, and you could then do the checklist. And the checklist is the beginning, during the day, and then close of polls. If you're not the kind of person, because I see a wall of words and I don't read them, because my brain just, I, I, I have a lot of things going on, and I, I don't have time to read a lot of words. Especially because it's election day, I'm jazzed up, I want to do a good job, I might be brand new, I might be concerned about how things have changed, I'm not up to date on all of these changes, I want to look competent with all my team, they're behind me, they want to see me as the fearless leader. So I, if I get into these words, I might get a little bit confused, and, and, and that might be too much for me. So then there's the IKEA, IKEA model of education, which is the photos with small amounts of words. IKEA doesn't have any words. We at least do some words, okay? That's going to show you step-by-step step through photos how to log into the tabulator, how to turn it on, how to open the polls, um, how to print a zero report tape, for those of you who are brand new and have never voted in person, this is the tabulator right here and the ballot bin. We're going to make sure we check in the morning that there are zero ballots inside our tabulator. This is where I make my obligatory joke about how, you know, we start with zero votes being tabulated on election day. As I move forward, there's information here about set, how to set up the voter assist terminal. So if I'm the individual who is going to be tasked with doing that by my chairperson, I would maybe bring my manual and I would pull and open it up and I would go through those processes. Then there's information there about how to set up the EPB or the laptop, how to set it up. I also have a video, but I have written instructions as well. Then I go into the election inspector positions. This is what occurs while people are voting. I've got some information here on the first page about how we are changing the voting process. You as an election inspector, your job is to help people vote. You will work in a precinct, a precinct a polling location will have multiple precincts. You could work in an AV counting board. I'm not going to go over that process because there will be a training on election day for anybody assigned to the AV counting board. Regardless of where you work, in a precinct or in the AV counting board, you are a precinct or an election inspector. We have to send the assignments to the election commission and it has to be approved by the election commission. We need to do the training to see who the qualified inspectors are, and we need to balance based on partisanship. So that is why you will not be notified of where you are going to be assigned until about three weeks from today. Chairs will find out in two weeks if they have been elevated to the position of chair, and they will know they're, where they're working. We are going to have to focus on balancing partisanship because, as I said before, elections have become a little bit more controversial than they have in the past. I ask you to be charitable with those adjustments because we don't have a whole lot of inspectors this time. We already talked about 
what to do when you receive your assignment. We talked about polls opening at 7 and closing at 8. We talked about coming at 6, probably not leaving till 9, with the exception of student inspectors. State law will not allow me to violate labor law. Child labor law is unfortunately changed, and we can't work them for 15 hours. <laughs> Uh, so they can come and go. Uh, chairs just don't have, do not have them sign the poll books. It's easier that way. Have them swear the oath, but they don't have to sign the poll book. Um, absences or changes in availability. I'm going to ask you to report them to me immediately. Um, being an election inspector is an interesting position. It's not a job, but it's also not a volunteer position either. This isn't the Kiwanis. We're not doing a pancake breakfast. We're not raking leaves at the local park. You can't just say, ah, there's other 30 other people. They're going to show up. I, I, I really wanted to help out today, but man, I was up late last night, or the one-year-old wouldn't sleep. I'm so tired. They'll understand. They're going to have plenty of inspectors. No. There are a few positions that require the swearing of an oath. When you raise your right hand, and those would be the U.S. military, those would be public safety or first responders, so police and fire, and all elected officials in the country. Also, precinct inspectors. You swear an oath. You swear an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. You don't swear to the president. You don't swear allegiance to the flag. You don't swear allegiance to me. You're not swearing on me. You are swearing an oath to protect the Constitution of the United States. States, a piece of paper, a set of ideals, the notion that we can become a more perfect union. That is sacred. That is almost spiritual in my mind. We swear an oath to protect the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the state of Michigan, which is cool but not nearly as cool as the U.S. Constitution. Primarily because under the Michigan Constitution you have to be 21 to vote because it was done in 1963 before they passed the amendment that allowed 18-year-olds to vote. Um, so we haven't changed that constitution. So the Michigan Constitution is invalidated by federal law because of um, kind of how legal law, laws work. Um, but, um, but yeah, so the Michigan Constitution is pretty cool too. But, and then to faithfully discharge the duties of election inspector. We will always defer to the rights of voters the rights of challengers. We work for the people. Elections belong to the people. They don't belong to the political parties. They don't belong to the government. They don't belong to the, to the elected officials. They belong to the people. And you are the people. So I'm going to ask that you take that oath sincerely. And when we commit to working Election Day, we show up and we understand that when we show up, we are tapping into something much bigger than ourselves, much bigger than beautiful Sloan, who has kept me up for six hours all night, and that I know for at least 15 hours I can drag myself across the finish line and help administer this election. Because somewhere somebody is fulfilling an oath. Some first responder is showing up to the scene of an accident and witnessing something horrible and solving that problem. Some service member is somewhere putting their life on the line for me. This is my opportunity to do my civic duty. Communicate in advance because life does happen, right? We know two things. If we haven't learned it in the last two years, we're never going to learn it. Life isn't fair, clearly, um, and life will happen. And so I understand that. So if you call me, please buy the Friday before the election and tell me, Man, Michael, your speech was riveting about the significance of the work that we're doing, and you had me. However, a life event has occurred, a tragedy in my family, a health-related issue. Something has happened. I can't show up. I will say thank you. Thank you for taking this seriously, and thank you for notifying me with enough time to find a replacement for you. I will not shame you or harass you or challenge the significance of the issue. So please just try to meet your commitment. If you can't, tell me beforehand. And then look for an email about where you're going to be assigned. 
Election day has been arrived. Now what? Arrive at 6 a.m. Find your chairperson. Chair people, um, you're going to get a list of all the people who are in your precinct who have been assigned. A good chairperson will reach out to everybody before the election and say, hey, welcome team, I'm your fearless leader. Here's a couple of fun things you might want to think about. You don't know how the AC is going to be in the location, so you might want to dress in layers, knowing that you might need to take some things off, but you also know that it might be extremely cold inside the building too. So dress in layers is a smart thing to do. Wear comfortable shoes, because it's going to be a long day. Um, maybe bring a book because we may have some downtime or a puzzle. Also, sometimes our team likes to do a potluck. I'm bringing a crock pot. I like to make my famous chili. If you don't like chili, don't worry about it. But if you do, I'm going to have a crock pot. Everybody's going to bring one thing. If you want to participate, you can bring some cornbread. Some chairs will do that. It's a fun little thing. You'll have a couple of weeks before the election to kind of figure that stuff out. Um, some people won't but at least the chairs should kind of reach out to people, get an idea, try to call everybody ahead of the election, and they can kind of be my eyes and ears and notify me if, somebody, if something's happened. Someone might be like, hey, I got a weird diagnosis. I don't know how I feel about it. This, there could be some medical stuff that happens. I don't know if I can do this. They'll tell me. So you should know who your chairperson is prior to election day, but when you arrive, if you, if you haven't, met or heard from or talked to your chairperson, they will be the person holding this, the red chairperson binder. And with this comes a lot of authority. All of my power is in this beautiful red chairperson binder. Um, this is where they're going to have the paper poll book. It's where they're going to keep the keys with the I button for the tabulator with the voter poll worker card for the, the voter assist terminal. Chairs when you leave on election day, if you go on your break, you're going to give this to a responsible party inside the precinct who will then be responsible for putting it on their wrist. We won't misplace it. We won't lose it. We're going to hold on to it. The receiving board ticket, there's your fifth one, will be here in the blue. You're going to have all your passwords. First things first. I probably would pull this out and give it to my electronic poll book person so they could start doing the poll book because there's three passwords they need. And then I'm going to be thinking, oh, someone's got to set up the voter assist terminal. They're going to need the passcodes too. So <laughs> I'll tell the EPB, once you're done with that, can you give it to Steve? Because Steve's going to set up the VAT. I'll say, Steve, you're going to get the password code next. And then I might say, before you do that, I, I'm a, I'm a hands-on chair and I've got trust issues. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. And I think that the tabulator is the most important thing, so I'm going to be the one to set this up. So while you're setting up the EPB, the poll book, and while you're setting up the voter assist terminal, I'm going to be setting up the tabulator. So I'm just going to make sure I get my passcode now. And the passcode is always the date of the election. So it'll be 080222 six digits, and I'd walk over here and I'd start doing my tabulator stuff and I'd get my I button ready and I have my passcode and my EPB is up and running and so they're going to pass that paper on and my vice chair or somebody else in my precinct is going to be setting up the voter assist terminal and other people are going to be setting up stuff inside of the precinct itself. The signage, the rights of voters on the walls, the voting booths, it's all going to happen like a beautiful symphony. Is that a change? Anthony was an ambitious man. <laughs> and I would rather tell you that you have to set up all that stuff and have you pleasantly surprised by walking in on election day and seeing it all set up for you than telling you it's going to be done and then failing to meet my commitment <coughs> that it's going to be done. So just two different styles of doing things. Um, our intention is to at least have some things like the voter assist terminal set up for you. Um, and, but there will be work to do in the morning. So um, we will not have the entire precinct set up. But the layout will be done probably. Inside here you also have name badges, election inspector, 
We're working on getting some cool stuff for you too. Uh, and then stuff for challengers. Little, little name badge for a challenger if you want to put that on the challenger. I would expect to see challengers this election uh, because again, um, elections have become a lot more controversial. And these won't be our standard challengers who trust us and trust the process and know that we're like decent human beings and we're doing a good job. These will be new challengers, people who think we're criminals, don't trust us, are super, super, super um, uh, suspicious. They will probably not have a good understanding of what you're doing. Um, and so we're going to have to ensure that we treat them well, we respect them, especially respect their statutory duties and rights, because they have them. But we're also going to make sure they don't talk to voters because they're not legally allowed to. They can't challenge a voter to their face. Now, if you've got a challenger in your precinct and they're like nice, like, hey, how's the weather? Hope you're doing good. Hi, Sally. I haven't seen you since Little League. That's an okay exchange. But if someone comes and says, I don't think you're a valid voter, I'm going to challenge you. How, you don't live there anymore. I've been past your house. That's a vacant house. There's a lot there. There's not an address there. Excuse me, sir. Yes, ma'am. Huh? Excuse me, sir. You can yes. Oh, sir, I'm going to have to come over here. Challenges need to be made to the chairperson, not to the voter. That's how we handle that. Anyway, we'll be fine with them. And like I said, we're going to have rovers around. But that's part of the reason why we're changing things up. Because we have decided as a society we can't be adults about elections anymore. And everything has to be controversial. And we have to believe everything we read on the internet. My office is taking over more responsibility with regards to running the election itself to ensure we don't have any type of mild discrepancy that could be considered a conspiracy theory in the future and get me on the front page of the newspaper. Um, because, as Shakespeare says, the truth will out. The truth will always come out. It is sometimes a very slow, arduous, painful process, and people are very resistant to the truth, especially right now. On side of that, we have change of address forms for voters who have changed their address. There's a process for that. Affidavit of an absent voter. That's going to be important for voters who have requested an absentee ballot but choose not to vote their absentee ballot, we're going to have to have him sign an affidavit. And we're going to have to give those back to my office. And there's a whole process for that we'll get into. You have to, you'll have to, um, those are going to have to come back to my office. And we'll talk about that later. Precinct delegates. This is my least favorite election, um, the August primary, because even though turnout's lower, um, we have precinct delegates. And precinct delegates can file a write, as a write-in to you. They can fill out a form and then write their name in on the ballot and then they get elected. And then you have to give that to me. We have to certify them, send them to the county. It just makes a little bit of extra work. Um, who here worked in 2018? August of 2018. That was my first election. It was a primary. We never trained to the precinct delegate stuff. There was a separate form, and chairs didn't know about it. And so when you got in, and I didn't know about it because I was brand new, um, when you got in at the end of the night, we were like, where's this form? And you guys were like, you never trained us on that form? You never talked about that form? We don't know about that form. Um, and a lot of people were angry at me. My deputy clerk at the time left the building because she was accosted by a chairperson who was so furious. Um, that we had not trained to it, and I was upset about it too. But we rallied, we adapted, we overcame, we moved on, we changed our processes for November, we had a smoother election, we changed our processes again, we had a smoother election in 2020, we got there. Those precinct delegates, um, they can file with you. I don't like it, but it's okay, that's the law. We're going to get to a lot of things. Whether I like the law or not, the law is the law, and we always follow the law always follow the law. Here's my voter information stuff that we're going to post on the board for the voters. And then my list of inspectors, everybody who's been assigned to my precinct. They're going to sign in on election day so they can get paid. If you want to make money for this, right? And then here's an extra manual, just in case you forgot to bring one in. But we're giving an manual to every inspector. And that includes chairs, but if, if you know, so there, there should be manual in there. But if not, we're guaranteeing there's at least one manual in here. 
And if I can get them from the Bureau, we'll have those blue managing your precinct on election day flip charts that I was just talking about how great they are. Don't forget, there's also a receiving board ticket inside there too. That's six, okay? So that's my three person, my, my binder, and that is um, how I'm going to determine who my chairperson is. They're going to make me swear an oath. I'm going to sign the poll book, and then I'm going to be given an assignment. We're also going to talk about breaks. Outside of lunches, we're going to have 30-minute breaks. Roles and responsibilities for administering the election is also going to be determined by the chairperson. Who is the greeter? Who is the poll book? Who's at apps to vote? Who's at the, at the ballot stubs? That'll be determined by the chairperson. Some people like to rotate. Some people don't like to rotate. That's going to be decided by the chairperson. Okay? All right. You're going to locate all of your supplies. And this is important, too, because we get a lot of ESRs in the beginning of the day. Michael, I can't find my apps to vote. Okay, did you look in the big compartment? Because they're in your bag. But what about the red transfer container? I can't find it anywhere in the big compartment. Oh, did you look in the front pouch? Because there it is. Oh, yeah, but you never gave us scissors. We need scissors. Did you open up your red tackle box? Because your scissors are in your red tackle box. No, we didn't get them. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, we got them. That's okay. You've just occupied my staff for the first 15 minutes on the phone with you about scissors instead of handling other issues like the programming isn't working on this tabulator. We need to reburn it real quick, run it out to you, maintain chain of custody, get it up and running before 7 o'clock because voters have a right to vote at 7 a.m. But I'm glad we talked about scissors for the first 15 minutes. What about tape? Oh, it's in there too. I'm going to talk about paper clips in a little bit. And I got a little rant about paper clips. I like to rant sometimes. I have a rant about paper clips. We're going to get into paper clips later. If I don't bring up paper clips, somebody remind me that I promised a good rant about paper clips, okay? We've caught up to our manual. This is our new layout. I have referred to voting in the past. Michigan is one of eight states that administers elections at the local level. That means 42 other states plus the District of Columbia administer them at the county level. If I live in LA County, there are nine million residents, which is almost the population of Michigan. If I live in LA County and I live in the valley, and that's my residential address, but I work. What's another place in LA? Like, I don't know. Who knows California? But I work in Hollywood. Guess what? I can go to my job at Hollywood Universal Studios in Hollywood. I can work. I can finish working around 5:30, maybe 6 o'clock if it's a busy day. I can go to a polling location in Hollywood and vote a ballot, even though I live in the valley because the election is administered by the county. But that's not Michigan. We administer elections at the hyper-local level. The township clerk or the city clerk runs the election. So while California has about 90 counties and there's only 90 clerks in California, there are 1,600 clerks in Michigan because there's 1,600 municipalities. 1,600. There's 400 cities and 1,200 townships which is why townships are better than cities, despite what you might read on Facebook. <laughs> that said, we vote in place. It doesn't matter if I work in the city of Detroit. I can't vote in the city of Detroit. I have to return from Detroit to Canton to vote. We are a vote in place state. It has been called the Norman Rockwell style of voting because it brings to mind a traditional small town past where I show up to my local hall or school and I get in line and I see my neighbor and my neighbor is running the precinct and life is great. Unfortunately, voting in place is like really difficult for voters. It makes them jump through a lot of hoops to vote. But it's fun. It's beautiful and it's lovely. And we're going to keep that element because we are required by Michigan law. 
If you live in a precinct, you vote in your precinct, your precinct has one physical location, you have to show up to your precinct to vote. However, we are implementing a regionalized vote center model. Um, another thing that has changed since um, the last election. I have begun taking classes through Auburn University in Texas. Go Tigers. Um, the National Conference of Election Officials, also known as the Election Center, has a SARA certification course for election admins. I have begun that process of becoming SARA certified. At the same time, because two kids and three dogs isn't enough, along with being an elected politician who sits on the township board, who runs an office and runs the elections, I'm also getting a graduate certificate in election administration from the University of Minnesota's graduate school, the Hubert H. Humphrey School of Public Affairs. They have a really amazing course there. And what's cool about both classes is I get a lot of best practices from all 50 states. There is no national database, right? There's no national election system. Article 1, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution states the time, place, and manner of elections shall be determined by the state legislatures. States run elections. Every state has a different election system. Michigan's is stupid, but it's the system we got. Um, and it's, it's got its benefits. Um, here's how we're going to change it. So I'm taking MIT queuing theory, queuing theory from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, about how to improve your processing and maximize efficiency. It has been adopted by Disney and their theme parks, Cedar Point. A large number of concert and gaming venues use this. This is how to move a lot of people through one choke point as efficiently as possible. Instead of the buffet Norman Rockwell style of voting, I walk in, I fill out an application to vote, I say hi to an inspector, I walk my application to vote with my ID to the poll book, I walk to the next person, I get a ballot, I walk to the booth, I fill out my vote. I walk to the ballot stub location, and I put it in the tabulator. Instead of the, buff the buffet style of voting, where precinct one is located on this wall, and precinct two is located on this wall, and precinct three is located on that wall, and they all act as autonomous, independent islands, chairs being the king or queen in their castle the end-all, be-all, judge, jury, and executioner of how things are done on Election Day. We walk into the regionalized vote center model. I am the voter. My precinct has changed. I don't know my precinct number, even though I do. It's 15, right? We looked it up. I used to be 17. I like 17 better than 15 as a number, so I'm a little sad that I changed my own precinct, but I'll get over it. I walk in. Michael Segrist, precinct 15. But there are three precincts there, 14, 15, and 16. As I begin to approach the greeter table, the greeter will say, excuse me, sir, can you please approach one of the application to vote table? There will be a mask there if I want to put a mask on as a voter. There will also be an application to vote, which is a written request to vote. Every individual must sign a written request to vote, right? physical paper app. I sign this, then I tell the voter, the greeter will tell me, also please have your ID ready. Perfect. I approach the greeter table. There may be three greeters there, but they are not precinct specific. They have a tablet with the greeter app on it, which is a modified version of the poll book, a little different. The voter will tell them their last name. They will type it in. They will say, oh, are you Michael Segrist? Yes. Okay, you're, please proceed to line 15. They will write precinct 15 on my application to vote and give it to me. I walk to the poll book. 
I get in line, either line 14, 15, or 16. In this case, I get in line 15. And the EPBs are next to each other at the same tables. And I ha I, instead of handing them my ID, or instead of swiping my ID, which is awful, here's a little fun thing. You guys get what my office has. The Honeywell scanners. They will, I would set mine up facing outward so that my EPB folk are sitting here. The voter walks up with their ID and goes, boop, and they pop up on my EPB right away. And then they show me their, my, then you say, okay, can I see your ID? I show it to you, you look at the photo. You look at my face, you look at the name in the poll book, you look at the name on my ID. Am I the same person? Yes. Pay very close attention to date of birth. Because sometimes fathers and sons have the exact same name. And there is nothing more unnerving than walking into a voting location and being told that you already voted. You will immediately get on the internet and you will create a new conspiracy theory that will go all the way to everywhere. California, people will be talking about it in Pennsylvania. They're giving ballots to everybody. All we did was accidentally issue in the poll book a ballot for junior that should have gone to senior. And so when junior walks in, he's like, wait a minute, I didn't vote. I've been at work all day. Oh, then they look at the signature, they oh, that's my dad. My da that's my dad, we have the same name. So check that DOB while you're doing it, okay? Because it'll happen, and it makes you look really unprofessional. Because it really terrifies people when they show up to a voting location and they're told that they've already voted. Um, but is there a question on what you said about the breeder table? The person comes in, he approaches the breeder. They say, they say, "What's your last name? Can I look you up?" Okay, beautiful. You're in precinct 15. Please proceed to line 15. Here's your application to vote. And because he's using the greeter application on the tablet that he has, okay. or she, he or she. The greeter has ta a, tablet. a tablet. Yeah, because we got you brand new electronic poll books. And so we took the old poll books and turned them into greeters. That's just a whole new process. And what's beautiful about this position, too, is the greeter is going to be looking for status flags. The little red check mark next to a voter's name that might mean that they don't necessarily qualify for a ballot without more information. I'm 92 years old. I surrendered my driver's license because it's no longer safe for me to drive. I've been engaged in six automobile accidents in the last month. So I surrendered my driver's license, which notified the Bureau of Elections that I may have moved out of state. I surrendered my driver's license for some reason. All right, am I required to have a driver's license to vote? No, not under the Michigan Constitution. So surrendering your driver's license doesn't stop you from voting, but it's a worry for us. And so there is a status flag. And I know, because of the manual, it tells me how to satisfy that status flag is I will ask the individual, oh, you surrendered your driver's license? They're like, yeah, my kids made me surrender, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what's your address? Well, I live at 245 Princess Drive. Thank you. Here's your ballot. You can vote. So the greeter can pre-sort status flag issues, but the line always moves. So if a status flag pops up, voter comes up, there's an issue, confirm residency. I need a chairperson. Sir, can you please step to the side? I need a chairperson. Can I have the next voter? The greeter takes the next voter. The chairperson handles the status flag. And then that person gets taken to the EPB. They get the status flag resolved. They get their ballot. They vote. But the line always moves, OK? Um, Correct. Who here knows what precinct they're in? Probably nobody because it's changed. 
unless you're in 27. 27 didn't change by a, a pure stroke of luck. Every other, every other number has changed. So nobody knows their precinct number. Is there any benefit to knowing your precinct number? Under the old system, yeah, because you knew what side of the gym to go to. Under this scenario, you just need to know what line to get in. And you're going to be told what line to get in by the greeter. And we're not going to say, OK, go to precinct 15. Because that's a term of art that means something to us. But it means nothing to a voter. They come in, they're in line 15. They say, please proceed to poll book 15. Get to, go, go in line 15. They go into line 15. They get a ballot for precinct 15. They proceed to the voting booth. They make their choices. They approach the stub removal table where there could be three inspectors working for all people. I approach. This inspector looks at the stub for the ballot that's in a secrecy sleeve and says, OK, they're going to pull out my application to vote, which is on, in my secrecy sleeve. And they're going to say, all right. Ballot number, ballot number 401 on the application. Ballot stub 401 on the ballot. It matches. I see it's for precinct 15. Please go ahead to tabulator 15. I'm standing 10 feet away, ensuring ballot secrecy. The voter will slide their ballot into the tabulator, vote, and leave. So in this scenario, inspectors will be serving voters from multiple precincts, with the exception of one station. One station will only handle voters from one specific precinct, the EPB. One, two, and three. Based on how many inspectors we have assigned, this position could be one person. Issuing a ballot in the, in the, in the computer and handing the ballot to the voter. Confirming that those are, in fact, they balance, that they, that they match. OK. The chairperson, the vice chairperson role is designated in our, poll, in our manual. How to review an application to vote is in the manual. Position num station number one is in the manual. The greeter. Position number two, the laptop inspector, who can also be giving people a ballot. Inspector position number um, three uh, and that is going to be the ballot inspector and then position number four is stub removal. Okay, And that's going to tell you a lot of specifics about each position. So if you've got your manual on election day and you've been given an assignment by your chair, pull out your manual and read about your position. Okay, there's other information there about administering the election. There's information there for station number four about what to happen when the tabulator acts up. Remember, this is a primary in Michigan. There's no such thing as a registered Democrat or a registered Republican in Michigan because you don't register by party. In Florida, you register by party. In New York, you register by party. You can associate with any political party. You can become a member of any political party. As an inspector, you can identify with a political party on your application to vote. But you are not a registered Democrat or a registered Republican because we don't have a closed primary. Democrats and Republicans can vote in each other's primaries in Michigan if they want to. However, you can only vote in one. We are not an open primary system where I can get my August ballot and vote Republican for governor, Democrat for senator, Republican for Congress, Democrat for state representative. In the August primary, I can't cross over or I spoil my ballot. My vote doesn't count. I must stay faithful to the partisan section. And every 
August election, between 5 and 10% of voters will, will cross over vote. And when they get to station number four, they'll try to put their ballot in the tabulator and it won't go through. And you're going to ask them, did you cross over vote? And they're not going to know what that means. You're going to ask them, did you, did, did you stay in the lane? And they're going to say, yeah, I did. It's a lie. They didn't. They think they did. They don't even know what you mean. In one precinct in 2018, a guy spoiled three ballots in a row. And he was belligerently angry. It was his first time voting. And he was going to leave without voting. He was so mad. And, and me, being the democracy nerd that I am, I was like, you cannot leave. I don't care who you're voting for. You cannot leave. This is your first time voting. I'm not sending you home with this voting experience. So I put him on the voter assist terminal because you can't spoil a ballot on the voter assist terminal. Once you select Republican or Democratic primary, you're stuck. You have to vote. So if you have somebody who keeps spoiling ballots in August, put them on the vat because you can't mess up there. But he kept crossing over, over, and over, and over again. And they will. But turnout will be a little bit muted this election. It won't be like 2018. Turnout will be slower, lower, which means you're going to get your standard primary voters back. These are, the, these are the professional voters. These people, they vote, they vote often, depending on the, not, not multiple times in an election, right, because that's illegal and not possible. Um, but they don't vote multiple times in one election. But they vote frequently. They know the rules. They follow the rules, okay? And in America, we have one rule. We have one rule about how to run a good democratic election. And by, that's, um, that's, that's small d democratic, right? Whether it's a Republican form of government or not, every advanced democracy in the world follows this rule. One voter, one vote. One voter, one vote. One ballot, let's say. And that's the key. Forget everything I say. Forget challengers. Forget computers. Forget all of the stuff that we do. If you have 400 voters show up and you count 400 ballots, you've done a good job. And we do everything we can to ensure this. This is the foundation of our system. And when you see me on election day come into your precinct, I'm going to sneak in really quietly, and I'm going to walk to the tabulators first, and I'm going to look on the tabulator, and I'm going to see 400 voters, 400 ballots. Then I'm going to walk over to ballot station number four, stub station, and I'm going to check the highest application to vote, and it's going to say, Ballot number 400. That's a balance. We're in shape so far. Then, I'm gonna, then I'll get loud, and you're going to see me be my normal voice or self, where I'm like, hey, how's everyone doing? We having fun here today. What's going on? Everyone doing a good job? How you doing? Oh, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Where are we at in the poll book? How many, how many voters should be 400? If it's not 400, the conspiracy theorists will come eat our lunch. Because what will often happen is that number will be 399. And the free press or the news will run an article that says, Detroit votes more ballots than voters. Canton Township, more votes than voters. Fraud. Is there fraud? Is there fraud in that situation where there's 399 voters in the poll book and 400 voters votes in the tabulator? Who here has experienced this happen in your precinct? Yeah, it happens every election at least twice in Canton Township. Luckily, we don't have 1,500 precincts like Detroit. 793 precincts like Detroit. If, we, if I did, it wouldn't happen twice, it would happen a hundred times, which is what happens in Detroit, and then they get in the news. Um, no, 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 no. So, what is the cause of that? It's one simple thing. 
the electronic poll book, the person at station number two, didn't hit enter. It is always the same issue. They didn't hit enter. Voter 100 comes in and they receive ballot 100. Blip. My ID scans in. The electronic poll book grabs me as a voter. It auto increments to the next ballot from the previous ballot that was issued. All things are great so far. Voter 100, ballot 100. What is the EPB supposed to do in that situation? Look at the ballot number. Look at the physical ballot. They match. 100 is in front of me, 100 on the screen. Either hit enter or click assign. If I don't hit enter or click assign, I give them their ballot and they walk off. Now, Michael Segrist is a valid voter. He has shown his photo ID. He is registered to vote. He votes his ballot and puts it in the tabulator. But then, Lindsay Fanning comes in. And she requests a ballot. And our EPB person is really busy and really stressed, and they're not paying attention. And they grab ballot 101. And when Lindsay scans her license, it pushes out Michael, because we never hit enter. Now we have Lindsay Fanning voter 100, ballot 101. But nobody, or ballot 100, but no one's looking. No one sees, they just grab ballot 101. Lindsay gets ballot 101, the system never recognizes that Michael Segrist got a ballot, even though he's a valid voter, even though it's legal, even though we're running a legitimate election. Our number of voters and our number of ballots doesn't match. And we don't catch it because we're busy. And we're not balancing every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes. And we're moving on. We're churning along. We're not balancing. We don't catch it until 45 minutes later. We have processed 50 voters. We're in trouble. The clerk's here. He wants answers. Why are you trying to get him in the newspaper? Why do you want him called a bad clerk who runs a crappy election? What are you doing to the clerk? Are you committing fraud? No. And so I, I'm going to grab those applications to vote, which is how we're going to solve this problem. But we're going to have to keep processing voters while we solve this problem. And I'm going to have you visually inspect those printed applications to vote and find out where the discrepancy lies. And what you're going to see is that Michael Segrist 50 votes ago, after I had to organize all of, my voted, all of my applications to vote by number, review every single one, and look for the discrepancy in the poll book, I will identify that we have a physical record of Michael Segrist voting, but we have no digital record of him voting. And so we will have to enter him into the poll book, and we will have to spoil ballot 100 and issue him a new ballot. And it's not fun. And it takes a long time to fix that problem on a busy election, which is why we pay attention when we're issuing ballots. It's why we balance our precinct. We didn't have an election in 2021, and so in 2021, in August primary, I was a chairperson in Hamtramck. I got to run. I got to experience what you all experience. And I had to work for another clerk, so it was really hard. I had to keep my mouth shut. Um, but I did. And I ran a precinct. And I balance us every 15 minutes because I am neurotic. And I know, I think about it like this. If I'm the captain of the Titanic or any big ship, and I turn that wheel one degree, nobody notices it over five minutes. Nobody even notices it over a half hour. Because it's just one little degree. We're just off by one degree. But if I don't redirect, that ship that is now slowly drifting in a different direction, if that goes for eight hours unaddressed, I am nowhere near my intended course. 
I now have to implement drastic action to determine where I need to go, figure out how to get back on course, and make sure that the ship is actually running accordingly. So I have to continue to be the captain, continue to make sure that things are getting done on the ship, that we're staying afloat, that everything else on the ship is going well, and redirect course ex and figure out exactly where we need to get to. That's not fun. So we want to address that before we get there. Yes? For you, it creates more work, but the fun downside to us is we don't get to go home until it matches. Yeah, you don't get to go home until it matches. But we know what didn't happen. We know nobody showed up with a random ballot and put it in a tabulator because they can't. You have to have the right type of paper. You have to have the right timing marks. You have to have a, a stub. You have to have all of these things that you can't just do. We also know nobody got two ballots because that doesn't physically happen either. And we know that the machine wasn't hacked because there are dozens of people in the room. No tabulator goes unwatched for any extended period of time. So the potential for fraudulent activity in a precinct with all of you there is almost zero. It is statistically significant to zero, despite what you might read on the internet. So the error is always a bureaucratic error. And it, if the error is caused by people, it can be solved by people. Ballot number will not coincide with voter number. You will need to spoil ballots. This is the voting process. The voter completes an application to vote. The voter, uh, voter registration is checked in the laptop. The voter is assigned a ballot number and provided the ballot and their identity is checked. The voter marks their ballot and then the voter puts their ballot in the tabulator. That's the application to vote. The maroon section of our manual is all about voto, photo ID. All voters must show an app, uh, uh, must show a photo ID. Just like all income is taxable from whatever source derived. But that's not factually true. If I sell my principal residence, do I have to pay capital gains tax? No, because I have a principal residence exemption. So even though Section 63 of the U.S. Code says that all income is taxable to the source from whatever source derived, there's an exemption. I can sell my principal residence, and I don't have to pay tax on the first whatever, $250,000, $350,000. I don't know, whatever it is. Um, as long as I've lived there for three years, it is my principal residence, and I haven't done it twice in five-year period, right? Those are the rules. All voters must show a photo ID unless they don't have a photo ID on them. In that case, they must sign an affidavit swearing that they are who they are. And they must sign it. In 2020, we had 58,000 voters. That's a good election. 58,000 voters. That's a lot of people. How many people do you think didn't have a license? Guess. Two. You said two. What? 27. 27. Now you're all way off. It's 112, which is 0.5% of voters. So 99.5% of voters in Canton Township on Election Day are going to have a photo ID. It will more than likely be a driver's license, which is super easy for us. Boop. They log up. We're good to go. But for those 112 out of 58,000, they're going to have to sign this affidavit, which is on the back of their application to vote. You need to witness it. You need to sign that too. Because they're swearing under penalties of perjury that it is factually true what they say here. If they lie, we're hitting them with a felony. But I told you all I was going to talk about paper clips. And I told you all about my beautiful children, Jack and Sloan, three and one years old. And they have, they deserve certain things in this world. They deserve a father who is there, who loves them unconditionally, who spends time with them, who helps raise them. These are the formative years of their lives. We're laying the foundation for the people they will become. They will be your future neighbors. Ideally, they will be taxpayers. 
Ideally, they will be good assets to the community. But if they don't have a father, what kind of a future are they going to have? I have seven days after an election to examine all of the affidavits in Canton Township. Check those signatures and submit a report to the Bureau of Elections and look for any fraudulent activity. But I just told you we had 58,000 voters. 58,000 applications to vote. For 112 affidavits. Have you ever tried to look for a needle in a haystack? This is my rant. This is my favorite rant. So I'm going to ask you to ensure that my children have a father. And it doesn't take me four days to go through 58,000 applications looking for 112 affidavits. I'm going to ask you, once somebody has signed an affidavit and you have signed it, to take one of these beautiful little paper clips, which has no other purpose but to be attached and affixed to the application to vote. So that what would take me four days takes me 30 minutes to review the signature, to make my report to the state of Michigan, and then to continue my duties as the father to my children. You will be doing yourself a service if you do that. So again, paper clips, please use them on the applications to vote. They're all there. We already did them. Oh, okay, this guy. They weren't last time. All right. Well, they will be this time. All right, this is the greeter. We already talked about this. They're going to have a greeter application database. They're going to pre-screen status flags, have people step out, have the chairperson take them. You know, oh, chairperson, Bob, we've got Michael over here is in precinct 15. He's got a status flag. You're going to have to resolve. Can you take him over to the EPB? Yes, I can. Excellent. Okay, next voter. That's how that process moves on. Okay, the passwords for this are going to be with the chairperson. Um, and then the lines are going to be the precinct numbers. The EPB is the laptop station. Not much is changing with this other than it could be the same as the ballot issuer. Right? They're going to look for those status flags. There's a whole bit in the manual on how to solve those status flags. It's also in the Managing Your Precinct on Election Day. It's also addressed in the 12-minute video on the internet. The voting booth area, we're going to make sure it's free from campaign material because people will get material from the candidates and the ballot proposals out in the parking lot. They can put it in their pocket. They can put it in their purse. They can bring it in to vote with them as long as they aren't showing it to other voters. They can pull it out in the voting booth and they can read it. They can pull their phone out in the voting booth. Now they can take a picture of their ballot. That's a new thing. What they can't do is take photos of anybody else. They can't take a selfie of themselves. Don't be the police and harass people. Any problem that goes out the door is a good problem. So if somebody does something and they break a rule but they're leaving, you know, maybe you don't tackle them. Uh, but we don't want people filming in the precinct, that's illegal. We don't want people taking photos in the precinct, that's illegal of other voters. Because a voter is going to have two rights. The right to vote a secret ballot and not be recorded while voting unless I give permission to a news outlet who is only allowed to film in the public area of a precinct, not the voting booth area. You have a right to a secret ballot in the Michigan Constitution. Additionally, they have the right to vote free from any form of advocacy, campaigning, or compulsion. Nobody wears campaign material in the voting area. Definitely not you. And definitely not voters or campaign folks. They cannot wear campaign material 
They cannot leave their campaign material in the voting booth itself. They need to stay 100 feet away from the entrance to the building. They can come in to use the bathroom because it's like they always get these kids to do it. And I feel bad for them because it's like August, it's like 95 degrees out. They're in the hot sun. All these schools are like brand new trees and none of them cast any real shade. They're all like these little small maple trees that are like five to ten years old. And so they're out there just baking in the sun. They can come in and use the bathroom as long as they take their shirts off and they don't have stickers and all that stuff. Voters are allowed to bring their children into the voting booth. Voters are allowed to bring somebody to assist them in the voting booth. Voters can't peek their head into another voting booth to help out a spouse. Right? Not happening. There's a, full, there's a process if you want assistance due to a disability or, an, or a lack of ability to read or write. But there's a formal process to get assistance. It is not What'd you get on item two? You know, like what'd you get for for, for item one? Like, Mike, yes. Um, stepping back just one uh, slide back to the ECB uh, inspector. It sounds like what changed the issue from the last time was the ECB inspector will not only sign the voting uh, number, but they'll also give the ballot. Could also give the ballot out. Depending on how many inspectors you have assigned to your precinct on election day would determine how you would if you would have one or two people in that position. Yep. Another question is they um, still restrict um, the person brought supervisor. Yep. They still they can't be in the booth with them. Correct. As well as a neighboring inspector. Bingo. If I'm a chairperson and somebody says, I, want, I need assistance. What I would do, even though I'm the clerk and even though I've memorized the, the law and the procedure, even if I'm, I'm in Hamtramck, and I had to do this in Hamtramck, I went in and I grabbed the Managing Your Precinct on Election Day blue flip chart, and I opened up to the tab Assisting Voters, and I went through the step-by-step -step process. And, and I don't mind taking my time. I don't care if people think I'm stupid in the precinct or they question my ability to know what to do. If I come in to fix a problem for you, I will most likely say, where are you at in the manual? What, what page are you on? Where are we at in the steps? Well, let's start with step one and let's walk through it. Because I want to not just give you the answer or solve the problem for you, I want to teach you how to go through the manual and use the manual. Because I give you everything you need to solve almost every problem that you will encounter. So in Hamtramck, when I had challengers, the first thing I did was grab my blue managing your precinct on election day flip chart, opened up to assisting voters, not challengers, when I had people needing assistance, and I said, oh, step one, ask the voter, are you requesting assistance due to a disability or an inability to read or write English? Yes. Now in Hamtramck was challenging because it was language assistance. And so what we decided we were gonna do in Canton is have that statement or question printed out in the major languages that are spoken in Canton. Arabic, Chinese, Urdu, um, Hindi, I don't remember them all, but I've got them. I got them from the school district. Um, the answer to that question must be yes. The answer to that question is no. Thank you, assistant. You have to stay here. The voter is free to move forward. You are staying here because this person isn't requesting assistance. If the answer is yes, I want that help, cool. I then move on my blue managing your flip chart, managing your precinct on election day flip chart to step two. I turn to the helper and I say, are you their boss or employer and or are you their union representative? And if the answer is no, which it has to be no, I say, excellent, can I see your ID? We're going to write your name in the poll book. And we write the name of the assistant in the poll book. Yeah. And then the two of them get to go to the booth and they can help with their ballot, as long as it's not their employer or union rep, and as long as the voter really wants help and it's not somebody who's coercing the voter. And we're going to look for cues to see if there's coercion. If there's coercion going on, 
you're going to do an ESR report and say, excellent, can you two stand to the side real quick and not say anything to them and say, we're gonna, it'll be a couple minutes. And then you're going to put in an ESR report or you're going to call the police department and say, looks like a husband might be pressuring a wife on how to vote or vice versa. I don't know what's going on here. And an officer will come, ask them to step outside, figure out the facts and circumstances of what's going on, and we'll make sure that no one's being coerced to vote a certain way. That's how we would handle that. Here's information about stub removal. You, um, some people, who here likes to keep all the stubs? Even though I tell you you don't have to. A lot of you don't trust me, and that's okay. I respect it. You have the autonomy to keep the stubs if you want to. But when the stub is removed from the ballot, it does lack a legal purpose. Some people like to keep it for a separate internal audit process that they would do themselves. Have at it. But I'm not going to teach you on what to do with those stubs. We will give you a garbage just like that over by the door that is where I file the stubs. I file the stubs in the garbage. Okay. Is that it? Yes. However, I'm a liar. There are a few other important details to remind her. No campaigning within 100 feet of the entrance to a polling location. Almost every task, assisting a voter, if it's going to be two inspectors, sealing ballot bins, going into the tabulator, must be performed by at least two inspectors of different political parties. Okay? Opening up the ballot bin, that's got to be a Democrat and a Republican. I'm sorry, Libertarians and Green Parties and working, working class people and U.S. taxpayers, you don't get to participate in that activity. You can be there as long as there's at least one Republican and one Democrat. Um, and for the new people, I always make a joke about our hyper-dysfunctional political system and how political parties hate each other and don't trust each other. And so this is how we weaponize that and use it against itself, by forcing them Two, two groups of people that could not agree on the color of the sky to make them work together on the same task and suspiciously watch each other while the votes are open, while a ballot is being reproduced, while a voter is receiving assistance from us. It's done by a Democrat and a Republican. Every inspector, every poll worker must sign the paper poll work in the morning with the exception of those student inspectors, okay? But since they're not signing, I don't want the student inspectors going in the tabulator, right? Um, must sign the zero tape, because we start with zero in the morning. We witness every single voter collectively, because we're going to take our breaks, we're going to go to the bathroom, we're going to get water, we're going to stretch our legs. But we collectively witness every voter. Then we all sign the results tape. Then we sign the paper poll book at the end of the night. And we're good. Inspectors can be called down. Who's, who, who here has had to go to Wayne County? Oh, okay. We got rule followers here. Every election, I have to do one of two things. Show up at someone's home at 1 or 2 in the morning with a police officer to bring them to Township Hall because they didn't sign something. Or send a, send a squad car in the next day to take them down to Wayne County to sign the stuff. Because again, while we all have rights as individuals, we also have duties. And when we raise our right hand and swear an oath, to faithfully discharge your duties means to sign all that paperwork. And so your oath to faithfully discharge those duties means you will sign those paperwork. So, at the end of the night, we're not going to snake out without anybody seeing us and think that, think, because ultimately, you know, in order to lie to me, you got to lie to yourself first, right? The lie you tell yourself is, I'm going to go to bed early. This has been a long day. I'm tired. Oh, God. No, you're not. If you sneak out without signing that paperwork, your night isn't over. Um, it's not going to be fun for you. So, you're not doing yourself any favors. So, wait until you are dismissed. We already went over the ESR report. Um, this is a cool stuff here. We have same day voter registration, so no voter is turned away. We did that in 2020, right? If somebody's not registered in the poll book anywhere, you're going to send them to the clerk's office. We're going to give them a ballot. 
What's this? Okay, we have a, a receiving board ticket, apparently, it looks like there, and I think that's the seventh time I've referenced it. This must be completed to, receive, to see the receiving board. It is the ultimate checklist. Have I mentioned this yet? Just wanted to make sure I've mentioned that receiving board ticket. It is required. Okay, um, and then, oh, Steve, you'll love this one. No more modeming results at the end of the night. This is where I love the conspiracy theorists, because they really helped us on this one. Uh, we all know that this machine is not attached to the internet right now. It's not attached to the internet before the election. It's not attached to the internet during the election. But there's a brief period after the close of polls. And what do we know? We know that the votes are on the physical paper ballots, which get put in here. And you can't hack a paper ballot. Paper ballot's a paper ballot. It's voted. It's done. It stands. Chain of custody. You indicated that you started with zero. You witnessed 400 people. There are 400 ballots inside of here. Those are the valid votes. They are records. The minute that stub comes off, they no longer belong to the voter. That's not my ballot anymore. It's been tabulated. It belongs to the people of the state of Michigan. It's their property now. It's subject to FOIA. So instead of going on the internet and making up weird random claims about voting machines being attached to the internet and what that could do to election results, I might just submit a FOIA and actually physically look at the 400 ballots in here and say, oh, wow, look at that. Michael Segrist got 10 votes for clerk. 390 other people voted for the other guy because he's a bum. Just kidding. I like it myself. But um, that's consistent with the election results. My goodness. I just learned something by doing what we have been doing in our society for thousands of years, which is I take in information, then I form an opinion, as opposed to starting with an opinion first. That would be doing a little bit of research. But the physical ballots exist. You ensure chain of custody the entire time. But we're no longer modeming results at the end of the night because those are unofficial results anyway. Those aren't, the, those aren't who determines who gets elected. They were a pain in our butts and that's the one period where these machines could be attached to some type of network after we have printed our reports, after we have closed the polls. So at the end of the night, we don't have to do that. So there'll be no modem in here anymore for you. So yay, that makes it simpler at the end of the night. A lot of times those wouldn't transmit anyway. It was a pain, you'd be like, Where's, where are our precincts? No one's come in, what's going on, yada, yada, yada. So it's the end of the night. You've done all of your stuff. You're following your checklist. You have kept the keys on your wrist and so you don't have to walk around in the middle of your presentation wondering where you set them down. You've kept the keys on your wrist. You've kept custody of your keys. You're breaking down your precincts. Okay, 8 o'clock, right, rolls around. What do we know? If you're in line at 8 o'clock, but you haven't voted, do you get to vote? Yes. Yeah. If you walk in at 8.01, do you get to vote? No. What if you're Michael Segrist, the clerk of Canton Township? What if you're Donald Trump or Joe Biden? Do you get to vote at 8.01? No. No. You don't. Nobody. Nobody, including me, gets to vote a ballot if they are not in line at 8 o'clock. I don't care if something horrible happened in their life. It's sad. And how I justify it is, right around 8.01, think about how your legs feel. Think about how your eyes feel. Think about how your body overall feels. Are you mentally tired? Yeah. Why? Because you're coming up on 14 hours straight, 13 of which anybody could have showed up and voted. Additionally, there is no excuse absentee voting. Anybody can request an absentee ballot up to 40 days before an election. While Michigan does not have in-person early voting, we still have early AV. And we have 13 hours on election day. 
And while I care about everybody's vote in Canton Township, I can't care more about their vote than they do. If they don't take the time to show up before 8 o'clock, they don't get to vote. And even if I thought they deserved it, I'm not breaking the law for anyone. And the law says you must be in line by 8 o'clock. So, at 8 o'clock, the chairperson announces like they are the town crier in 1624, the polls are now closed. Somebody will grab all of the applications to vote and they will start at the back of the line if there is one, and there won't be. And they give every voter in line an application to vote. And then all applications to vote are put in the supply case. Nobody, including Michael Segrist, gets an application to vote if they weren't in line. It's done. We're going to close the polls. We're going to print the results tapes. Then we're going to take out all of those ballots that have been voted. The verifiable record of the intent of every single voter in your precinct. We are going to take the black lid off. It's already off because our unvoted ballots came in this big. We're going to open up the lid. Got this for Father's Day. He says, asking about my dad jokes. If you know, I've got a lot of them. I was primed to be a dad well before my kids were conceived. We're going to take all of our ballots out. This is important. We're going to place them all in the blue ballot bin. But our job isn't done. Because a good chair is on the receiving board checklist. Oh, that's eight. And on top of that, they are also using the final section of the manual, the purple section, the light at the end of the tunnel. Can I get a time check? What time is it? Woo, all right, let's speed it up. I can go through the detailed description of what to do, and I can begin to do the IKEA process. Shut down my tabulator. Print the results tapes. Have every inspector sign the results tapes. Close the polls, power down. I can clip the seal on the front. Once the power is down, I can remove the memory cards from the front of the tabulator, placing them in the red transfer container. I know they go in the red transfer container because it's highlighted in red on that page. I then will take the ballots out and put them in the blue ballot bin. I know they go in the blue ballot bin because it's written, highlighted in blue. We like to color code stuff. All those ballots are going to go in the blue ballot bin. And then when I turn to the next page, it's going to remind me to do a step that is often forgot. And we're not going to do this to Chief James Craig, who's running in the Republican primary for governor as a write-in. There might be other write-ins. We're going to make sure they get the valid votes they are legally entitled to. You have to go through the write-ins. We're going to get those scissors or those tin snips. You have both of them, and they both can be used for this function. So if you don't have one or the other, you can use it for both. You're going to come in here, you're going to clip the seal that is keeping the write-in compartment sealed shut. I would then return the scissors back to the supply case. You're going to open up this and all of your write-in ballots are going to fall into the container. Making sure we have removed the general ballots first. Because if you commingle these ballots, your fellow precinct inspectors will never forgive you. Because you will not be leaving at 9 o'clock that night. You will have to examine all 400 or 500 ballots to determine which ones had write-ins 
and then you will have to continue with the process that you're going to go through. And that's a long process to visually inspect 400 ballots. Before um, tabulators and voting machines were invented in the 1890s, believe it or not, all elections were administered by hand tally. And so uh, you would have had to have closed the polls at 8 o'clock, and then you would have had to pull out all of the ballots. And then you guys would be writing down every contest on a spreadsheet and then tallying every vote that came in for each one, and then you would be certifying who won. Now we use the automatic Scantron system that is used in schools for grading tests. Um, because back then, no, there weren't a thousand people in a precinct. It just didn't, you know, there was like 50 people, and everyone knew each other. It wouldn't take that long. So once we've got our write-in ballots, we're going to take them to our table and pull them out. Some people, will have thought they were clever. And they'll write Mickey Mouse. And that's a waste of their time and our time, but it's cute. We don't care about Mickey Mouse. What we're looking for are valid write-ins. And I'm going to give you a list of valid write-ins. And you're going to see people like James Craig's name written in the Republican primary, bubbled in. And it might say James Craig. Craig, spelt correctly. You're going to open up your chairperson binder, pull out your poll book. You're going to make your way all the way to the back, because we're at the end of the night, to this beautiful spreadsheet. Write-ins only. This is probably for write-ins only, right? We're going to type in James Craig. We're going to write in James Craig, spelt exactly how it is on our first write-in ballot. We're going to write office governor, party Republican. And then we're going to put one hash mark, just like it's 1880. Then we're going to go to the next write-in ballot. Let's say there's a write-in vote for James Craig, but they put an E at the end of his name. Oh, no, it's not the same. We're going to write it exactly how they spelt it on row two and put one hash mark. Third write-in vote is spelt the exact same way as the first write-in. Cool. We put a second hash mark in row one. What if they wrote Craig James? You got to write it Craig James and then put in one hash mark. What if they put in Chief Craig? We write in Chief Craig, one hash mark. Because the Board of Canvassers, they're going to decide which votes go to the candidate who has submitted as a write-in. And we're only going to do that for valid write-ins. If someone didn't file a write-in, we are not doing that. Okay? Fair enough. Huh? I don't even know if he's filed yet, but he said in the media he intends to file. I don't know anybody else who's filed. I have no idea. To be honest, I'm really hyper-focused on just the administration of the election. So, like, I don't know a lot of the stuff about this. It's going to be a new thing. Yeah. Okay. Then once we're done with that process, those write-in ballots can now be commingled with the other ballots. No big deal. All the ballots go in here. I close it in on itself like a drawbridge. I put the black lid on top. Who has heard the term unrecountable? In 2016, Jill Stein did not win, obviously, the presidential election in Michigan because she was a third party candidate. She didn't even come close, but she filed for a recount. I had just been elected clerk. I had been clerk for 14 days. I had to take all of our ballots in these containers, sealed by all of you people, down to Wayne County for a recount. Some communities could not participate in the recount because they couldn't ensure chain of custody, or they forgot to hit enter and there were more votes than voters in their precinct and they didn't write it in the poll book. So they had no excuse as to why they were off balance. 
or they did not seal their containers correctly. And those clerks got some pretty bad black eyes. They were called bad clerks. There were, believe it or not, conspiracy theories about what had happened, which is often happens these days. And I don't want to be one of those clerks. I don't want your work product to be improperly scrutinized. So the way we solve that is we put the black lid on top of the blue container. And we take one of these beautiful little seals, and one Republican and one Democrat are going to write that seal number on a ticket that is in my supply case. We're going to put it on here. I go from the bottom not the top. And there's a reason why. And we're going to go up through the bottom hole, through the second hole, through the third hole, with our beautiful certificate on there. We're going to zip, seal it on both ends so that nobody can slip anything in or take anything out. And it's going to stay that way until either or both. This precinct has been recounted or it has been audited. But one of those two things is going to have to happen before I can break that seal. You're writing your initials, one Republican and one Democrat. Because what you're saying is, we started with zero. And just in our little corner of the world, Precinct 1 in Canton Township, Michigan, we all witnessed 400 voters. And we saw no fraud. Nothing weird. Well, you may probably saw some weird stuff, but nothing weird with the voting. We have the results. We all signed them. We have the physical ballots. We looked at the write-ins. We put them in this container. And one Republican and one Democrat sealed it with this unbroken seal. And as long as I seal from the bottom, it won't get broken in transport. As long as this seal is unbroken, and it is consistent with the seal number that is signed by one Republican and one Democrat, we have chain of custody. We have evidence if there's ever a legitimate election lawsuit that is brought forward that could question the tabulation of votes, a judge would use that as evidence. If there were ever any concerns about the machinery not tabulating correctly, this is your audit paper trail. And you've ensured chain of custody because you sealed it. And that's what you give to me. And then we keep it under seal until it's been released. And it's not released until it's been recounted or audited, despite what you might hear on the internet. And then it gets certified by the state of Michigan. They notify us that it can be opened. We cut those seals. My staff takes those ballots in teams of two, one Republican and one Democrat, if you're noticing a theme here. We put them in canvas bags. We seal them. We put them in the basement of Township Hall in a secure room that even the police department doesn't have access to, that is under camera. And we store them for 22 months in accordance with federal law because it is evidence. And in America, when you have charges, you have to provide evidence to back up your claim. And those would be subject to litigation that could occur over the next 22 months. They're also subject to FOIA. So if somebody wants to visually inspect those ballots because they believe something crazy happened, they would submit a FOIA. They would come in. We would open up the ballots. We would let them visually inspect the ballots and do their own tally. Then we would reseal them afterwards and store them for the remainder of the 22-month period. After the 22-month period, we shred the ballots in accordance with federal retention law. That's the rule. That's the chain of custody. And you play a vital role in that. You can be proud of that. I appreciate it. And that's kind of how that process 
works. That's the write-in process. That's sealing the ballot containers, which is on the last page. That's signing the paper poll book and writing those seal numbers down there. The third checklist you're going to have is the paper poll book itself. But my God, if you followed the instructions in, the, in this manual and you've done the receiving board ticket nine and you've checked off everything on the EPB, the paper poll book checklist, you should be received in two minutes. You're done. It's smooth sailing at the end of the night. Who has ever heard a stitch in time saves nine? That means by taking time now, I'm actually going to get, if I take a minute today, I'm going to get nine minutes down the line by doing something slow and right. We can't afford for you to move fast. If you move fast, you will go so slow. The Irish have a saying that says, more speed, less haste. By being less hasty, I move faster. Carpenters will say, measure twice, cut once. These are all things that say, address the voter in front of you, handle the issue in front of you, balance the precinct in front of you, do not let stress, anxiety, fear about doing a good job, the, the, the presence of a challenger disrupt your internal peace. Be sincere, be, 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 um, just be, you know, ensure that you do that, right? Um, so there's stuff there about how to, how to close down the laptop for our EPB person. If I'm an EPB person, I'm going to pull this out, my poll book person. I'm going to run my reports, get, my, uh, get all that stuff, follow everything there in accordance. Looks like at the end of the night, there's something here. I don't know what that document is right there on that page, but there's something there. Final steps. And then there's another QR code for the ESR. We put it in the beginning, and we put it at the end. It's also located <laughs> on the bottom of this sheet. There's the third location of the QR code. Once you've done an electronic support request, it's stored in your phone forever, okay? We will be doing election lab demonstrations of the actual equipment in July. Those will include setting up the precinct, starting the VAT, uh, starting the tabulator, doing the zero report, um, the laptop, opening the polls, closing the polls, reminder of reports to be saved. This will be done at our election labs if you choose to come. Uh, they are optional. Uh, they will be helpful. And we will notify you when those dates are set. You have access to the two videos online. And you can view those between now and election day. You have the actual manuals themselves. That concludes the basic certification training. Pay attention to the notices that may come out uh, for your assignment.